Welcome to the fifth edition of the Fly Report. We have two very special guests today. Steve Gillard, uh, the Regional Director for Sustainability for Boeing in Europe, the Middle East, Turkey, Central Africa, and Asia, and Carl Hauptmeier, uh, the CEO of Norsk eFuel. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, we're psyched. No, thanks, oh, thanks very much for having us. Of course. Um, so, you know, we came on today, I was hoping to ask some questions about the Boeing Norsk, uh, the recently announced e-fuel partnership. Super exciting. Um, can we talk a bit and start with, you know, what the primary goal of this project is and how it came to be? Yeah, sure. Um, well, maybe if I, if I take it and try and set this in a bit of context as well. Um, so, so the aviation industry is committed to net zero by 2050. It's a, an international commitment made at the ICAO level. And really, we've got a number of different levers to get there. So the first one is, is obviously um, operating the most modern fleets. Um, so every generation of aircraft is 20 to 30 percent more fuel efficient than the last. Then it's really how do we operate those fleets most effectively? Then it really comes down to, to sort of what's the energy system that we're actually putting in to our aircraft? And that that's really where the, the biggest gains can be made if we look out to 2050. And then just the next couple of steps, and I'll come back to renewable energy, are really around advanced technology, what might go into future aircraft. And then there'll always be a level of residual emissions and it's being able to, to remove those um, or offset them using schemes like Corsia. But that renewable energy chunk is really, really important. What we know, and really it's governed by physics, is that sustainable aviation fuel is the critical technology that we have between now and 2050. Um, it's the one that's going to make the most impact to the aircraft, that uh, the larger aircraft, which is sort of where the real challenge is around emissions. Um, and what we know about sustainable aviation fuel is that we need more of it and we need it to be cheaper. And so looking at a breadth of different pathways is really important. And, and pathways are really the different types of producing that fuel. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things I would say is sustainable aviation fuel in itself as a concept isn't new. We, we've been, we did the first flight in sustainable aviation fuel back in 2008 with Virgin Atlantic on a commercial aircraft. Right. But having said that, we need more of it and we need different ways of producing it. And one of the most exciting ways to produce it is power to liquid fuels. And I know that, that Carl will talk a lot about that in a moment. And really what we were looking for was a way to help to catalyze that power to liquid sector by working with a, with a, a great partner um, and we believe we found one in North Key Fuel. So with, with that, I'll let Carl probably explain a little bit about, about what he does. Awesome. Yeah, great. Look, happy to jump, jump right in. Um, we are North Key Fuel. We're a dedicated project developer um, to bring power to liquid projects off the ground. Uh, we probably need to explain what power to liquid actually is. Power to liquid in the end is the conversion of electrical power into hydrocarbons, AKA chemical energy carrier, AKA jet fuel. So in the end, what most people are probably gonna know and most listeners are gonna know from, from the fueling pump, uh, the biofuel, right? That's a conversion of bioenergy or biofeedstock into a usable fuel. Uh, we do the, do the same thing, but our feedstock is electricity. So we take CO2, electricity and water, we add a synthesis process and we produce hydrocarbons, which de facto can be used today in, in all of the existing infrastructures and engines. So every liter of fuel we burn, uh, which is a part of liquid fuel in the end, is, uh, is a liter of, of fuel that you don't need to, to supply via fossil means. Yeah, got it. So, and now, can you expect, a little, just to expand a little bit about that, so what is, if I'm thinking about power to liquids versus, you know, we just heard about Lanza Jet's new ethanol to jet yeah. uh, facility in the United States, just so that for me and our viewers to understand a little bit more about the specifics about what makes the, pow the uh, power to liquids process and facilities a little bit different or unique would be helpful. Yeah, if I, if I take that sort of initially, and then I, I think, you know, Carl can provide some great sort of, uh, sort of flavor and color around that yep. i think the reality is we're going to need all types of sustainable aviation fuel. right um, it's not it's not about picking a winner but it's looking at, at how do we move forward and essentially the way to think of it simply is i think there are three generations of fuel the yep. first generation is really that made from recycled fats and greases so that's really what is largely available today um, it's called the heifer pathway and so you'll, you'll you know you'll be able to see that that's really what's commercially available 
The second generation is, is really what um, companies like Lanza are working on and others, which is looking at how do we use wastes or how do we use, how do we convert alcohol to jet? Um, and really, we're starting to see that be commercialized and we want to accelerate that commercialization. Right. The third generation is really power to liquid. What's exciting about that, and, and Carl will explain it far more eloquently than I ever can, is that in theory, if you have enough renewable electrons and you've got access to, to water, the, the you can, you can, there's no limit on the amount of fuel we can pr produce. So um, that's, that's it's, a amazing, really, yeah. it's a really exciting pathway. We need a lot of renewable energy, um, but there are a few places in the world that are better than Norway to start that journey. Carl, do you want to take it from there? I think you've just said it perfectly, uh, Steve. In, in the end, I can only second it. Uh, it. It's really, I mean, it's in the word, right? A SAF is a sustainable aviation fuel. So every fuel that can be provided, that can be used in today's airplane, uh, that, that lowers the CO2 emission can be a sustainable aviation fuel. But then depending on the pathways, there's separate solutions. And the beauty of powder liquid is exactly that utilizing electricity as the primary energy source, and then basically riding on the wave of, of cheaper renewable power um, in well throughout time, but also into the future, and the availability of of renewable power, which in theory is endless, um, right. it gives you it gives you a scalable solution that actually allows you to reach the decarbonization targets before yeah. you hit any feedstock limitations. Yeah, that awesome, totally. So, and you know, on the heels of that, about at this forthcoming. ESAF facility, how much SAF do you anticipate producing per annum on a grand scale? And if you could provide some just some context about that, you know, perhaps the net the what is the net zero equivalent of that in flight terms would be helpful um, just to understand, you know, how powerful this this technology and the new facility will be. Uh, absolutely. In in the end, we're we're working on on multiple projects. Uh, so we're we're running a portfolio of projects. We are aiming to get three projects off the ground by 2032, which okay. would produce an equivalent of 250 million liters of fuel, of which approximately 200 million liters would be sustainable aviation fuel. Wow. Um, so those 200 million liters, just to give you a, a reference, maybe. I mean, it it always depends on what you look at specifically, but the typical sort of Medium, short medium distance flight between, for example, um, London to Paris, rather short distance, I guess. Um, right. I think that one burns around three to 4,000 liters of fuel, yep. roughly. Uh, so, so it's a decent amount um, that, that you can get, uh, that you can decarbonize. Um, but obviously, it's only a, a drop in the bucket. But we're also only one company with three projects, right? So, so this is really a global effort uh, that's going to need um, an industrial shift. So, so we're building a new industry here that's going right. to see a lot of production facilities, also some of which will be significantly larger than ours currently planned, uh, pop up all around the world. Got it. Steve, any thoughts on that? Or are there any other, you know, any thoughts on this project? And or, you know, are there any other SAF and sustainability related projects um, in the works throughout Europe and beyond that you'd want to discuss? Yeah, Europe's Europe's really exciting. Actually, there's a lot going on here. I mean, what we've seen over the course of the, the sort of the evolution of SAF is that the majority of supply has come from North America, largely because of sort of the the incentives that are that are offered, um, and we're now seeing sort of a large amount of the demand globally actually coming from Europe because of the mandates that are in place here. Um, I think what it shows, actually, and it goes to the point of, well, actually, how do we get SAF to scale more broadly is that there's a number of different factors at play. So one policy is really important. Um, and, you know, we tend to sort of categorize something as either a carrot or a stick. In reality, we probably need a bit of both um, to help to scale the industry. Um, it's partnership beyond the borders of aviation. So working with, with ourselves as, as the manufacturer to, to make sure we've got the uh, a solution that's materially compatible with today's aircraft and infrastructure is, is important because safety is clearly the first priority. But then also, how do we bring in finance? Um, you know, SAF is, is in some ways, you know, a relatively mature concept and a relatively mature set of technologies. Um, the challenge is, is actually working with financiers to get them comfortable to invest in the first of a kind of plants. Um, typically, financiers feel, feel more comfortable sort of coming in later in, in the evolution and deployment of new technologies. We want to get them comfortable coming in now because that, that's where the challenge is. So working very closely with our partners in the finance community to help them with that. 
Um, and then obviously the end user, the aviation community, working really closely with them. So there's no kind of one sort of answer to how do you scale this, but it's working with all of those different communities together and across boundaries. And we did a flight back in November 2023 with Virgin Atlantic. It was the first transatlantic flight on 100% SAF on a commercial aircraft. And the CEO of Virgin had a really nice way of putting it. He said, what we need is radical collaboration. And I think that's yeah. absolutely true. It's, it's that radical collaboration across industry boundaries. And, you know, and again, why we're so excited about working with Norsky Fuel to try and make things happen. Awesome. What have I not asked about this that I should have? Anything else, anything else regarding the partnership, regarding, you know, whether 2050 is still a realistic goal for net zero, um, et cetera? Uh, if you have an answer to that one, you know more than us. But we, yeah. I think maybe just to share some some optimism in this. Um, yes, it's absolutely achievable. And I think that just following up on what Steve said, it, it's not an easy task, right? It's a new technology that needs to be brought um, off the ground. Basically, you need to um, gain the trust of the investors, you need to prove that, that this is doable. But in essence, what we can say, it is doable. Right? The technology is, is developed and, and each and every component is is commercially available what we're doing is not reinventing the wheel we are basically recombining existing technologies to create something new that that fits our net zero targets so that is what we're trying to do and our role here and maybe not speaking as no ski fuel as project developer is exactly what steve has been been mentioning or hinting at it's it's we build up the collaboration we build up the framework the value chains the partnerships surrounding a project in order to make it um, comfortable for everyone to to move forward and do this leap of faith, do this first step and first of a kind. And I can assure you, the the first step, the first step is the hard one, right? Once yeah. you see a few of these projects going going live around uh, the globe, and to be honest, I actually expect them to be in Europe first. Um, you you will see a snowballing effect. I'm, I'm yeah. quite certain. Yeah, I'm and, sure. Uh, and we do have the legislation in place that also favors the development. Yeah, yeah and I, absolutely. I was just going to say, say in terms of, you know, optimism, I, you know, I think, I think there's lots of reasons to be optimistic, optimistic. I mean, this is an industry that, that kind of has been pushing the fuel efficiency piece for, for a very long time, as an example. And, you know, obviously, if we can reduce the amount of fuel that we burn in the first place, that that helps is the first step in the journey. And we have a tool. And, and if any of your listeners, you know, want to go and go and play with the, the, the coolest tool they'll ever use, it's called Cascade. Yeah. Um, so if you Google Boeing Cascade, it will enable you to show what are the ways that we're going to make plot that route collectively as an industry to, to 2050. It pulls out, again, the criticality of sustainable aviation fuel and why it is just so important. The independency between power to liquid fuels and the grid, we can we can play with that. But also, um really it just shows the that this is just not no one technology is going to get us there there's a number of different th pillars to this like i talked about before but again saf is key and it's why it's just so important that we, we kind of work with partners like norski fuel to accelerate the growth of that industry for sure and the economic factors have to be are gonna we assume will start falling into place once the supply increases because it seems like from what we're seeing the demand's already there if that's the right way of thinking about this yeah. yeah, great. Well, on that note, guys, thank you so thank you so much for being here. This was really insightful. This is a really exciting partnership, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. The pleasure was ours. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for having us. Thank you. Of course.